thank you all for coming. There are, as you are seeing people being directed to, some seats up front if you are still looking. And I want to welcome you on behalf of Senator Rockefeller, Senator Blunt, Board of Directors of the Alliance, to today's program on how a handful of states are expanding coverage using federal Medicaid dollars to purchase private insurance for low-income residents. Uh, just a few words of context. The Supreme Court decided in 2012 that the Medicaid expansion in the Affordable Care Act couldn't be forced onto states that each state could decide whether or not to expand coverage under the Medicaid program. And about half the states have moved forward with expansion. Other states have decided against expansion now. But some states are pursuing an altogether different path. The uh, third way in the briefing title and in the hashtag, if you're going to uh, tweet about this event. Um, and they're enrolling target low-income population from the Affordable Care Act in private insurance using federal Medicaid dollars. And to do that, they need um, federal approval in the form of a Medicaid waiver. Three states already have their waivers in hand and are operating their new programs. And today, we're going to take a look at the experiences of two of those states and a broader look at what some other states are proposing to do. Uh, we'll also look at the balance between, on the one hand, um, exposing these same low-income people to, say, additional premiums or cost-sharing, and on the other, uh, uh, additional, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, additional premiums and coverage as a condition of getting it, uh, and on the other hand, not getting coverage at all. So we're pleased to have as a partner today the Commonwealth Fund, a century-old philanthropy established to promote the common weal or the common good. And we're doubly pleased to have as the co-moderator Sarah Collins, who's vice president for the fund's health care coverage and access program, and someone with a very extensive knowledge of state efforts to expand coverage. Uh, Sarah, welcome back to the moderator's chair. We're looking forward to having you help frame the issues for us today. Thank you, Ed, and also on behalf of the Commonwealth Fund, I want to thank the Alliance and also extend a warm welcome to the panelists today um, and, the, and the audience. The Affordable Care Act um, expands health insurance. Let's get my slides up here. Nope, that's me. Dexter, nope. we'll have him up presently. <laughs> Steve Spitton's slides are good, too. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the law expands coverage through two, two major sources. First, um, private plans sold through the new health insurance marketplaces that are running in all 50 states for people and providing subsidies for people with incomes up to 400% of poverty or about 94000 for a family of four. And second, and this is the focus of the discussion today, a major expansion in eligibility for the Medicaid program up to, for people with incomes up to 138% of poverty or about 33,000 for a family of four. The federal government is providing 100% financing to states that expand their Medicaid programs that phases through 2016, that phases down to 90% by, by 2020. The law, as Ed mentioned, the law originally required all states to expand their Medicaid programs. The Supreme Court decision basically turned that into an option. And as you can see um, from this map, this has had significant consequences in what's happening on the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion. Only 22 states um, so, and the District of Columbia so far have decided to expand their Medicaid programs under allowable federal rules. Three additional states have HHS approval to try alternative approaches to expanding their programs, and two states are seeking approval to, to do the same. But about 23 states have not decided to move forward on their expansions. Because of the way the law was drafted, 
people with incomes in states that aren't expanding their Medicaid programs who earn 100% of poverty or more are eligible for the subsidies through the marketplaces, but people with incomes under 100% of poverty are not eligible, and this was because Congress basically assumed that everyone in that income range would have, would have access to Medicaid. Consequently, an estimated 5 million currently uninsured people in states across the country that aren't expanding their programs don't have access to any of the new coverage options under the law, and states are leaving a considerable amount of federal dollars on the table by not expanding um, their programs. Today we're going to focus, as Ed mentioned, on five states that face political barriers to expanding their Medicaid programs and were able to find a way forward through alternative approaches through very different from what is laid out in the Affordable Care Act. In order to pursue an alternative, states have to get permission from HHS, but they also have to agree to increase eligibility up to 138% of poverty. They can't do a partial expansion. HHS has used its authority under Section 1115 of the Social Security Act to grant permission to states who want to do this. Section 1115 allows demonstrations that advance the objectives of the Medicaid program. The Secretary has broad authority to approve these demonstrations, but is required to determine that a demonstration meets the Medicaid objectives, provides additional oversight, including an evaluation, and she has to ensure that there's public input into the process and ensure that it doesn't um, cost um, more than, than, than it otherwise would have under a, normal, under, under a traditional expansion. So far, HHS has granted 1115 waivers for three states, Arkansas, Iowa, and Michigan, and we're going to hear the details on Ar Arkansas and Michigan from Joe Thompson and Steve Fitton today. Pennsylvania's waiver application is under review. New Hampshire is in the process of applying. These states are all taking very different approaches, um, but with the exception of Michigan, most states are using what's referred to as mandatory premium assistance, where states use Medicaid funds to pay premiums for their beneficiaries and private plans offered through the marketplaces. States have also generally sought permission from HHS to charge premiums and add some cost sharing. Some states have also sought permission to reduce traditional Medicaid um, benefits, and some states have added wellness incentives. There are some pros and cons um, to these alternatives, and we're going to talk a lot about, about this today. Among the pros, first and foremost, these alternatives are allowing states to break through political barriers that they have faced and expand their Medicaid programs. Depending on the approach, and I'm really referring to the private, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the premium assistant, assistance approaches, these, these approaches have the reducible re, pr, potential to reduce churn when people's incomes change. So in other words, people don't have to switch between Medicaid plans and marketplace plans when their income increases above 138% of poverty or falls below 138% of poverty. Sarah, Sarah Rosenbaum and Ben Summers have estimated that 28 million people might have that kind of fluctuation in, in, a, given, in a given year. It also has the potential to increase the size of the marketplace risk pools. This is obviously a very big advantage to small states like Arkansas and New Hampshire. It has the potential to reduce administrative costs to federal and state governments. Among the cons, it may premiums um, that are added to these may lower people's participation below what the, it might otherwise be in a traditional expansion. And out-of-pocket costs and fewer benefits might reduce access to care. So I'll stop there and turn this back over to Ed. Okay, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, this is good, good context setting. Uh, let me do a little housekeeping, if I can, uh, before we turn to our speakers. Um, in your packets, there is a wealth of good information, including a blog post from Sarah and some of her colleagues at the Commonwealth Fund that is excellent in laying out some of the differences and similarities among the states that are trying to pursue this path. Uh, there are copies of the presentations of each of the speakers there. Are, uh, if we had them at the time, we put the papers together. Uh, there are biographical sketches that give you more information than we'll have time to give them uh, credit for in the briefing itself. There'll be a video recording of this briefing available in a couple of days, a transcript a few days later, both available 
at our website at the Alliance, allhealth.org. Uh, and the speaker slides, the rest of the material that are in the kits that the folks in the room are looking at are also posted on that website. Uh, at the appropriate time, you want to ask a question of one of the panelists. There is a green card in, which, in your packet that you can use to write the question. There are microphones in the room that you can use to ask the question yourself. Uh, and then there is a blue evaluation sheet in your kits that we would ask you to fill out uh, before the end of the briefing so that we can help make them even better as we go on. Uh, one word to uh, those of you who may be watching on C-SPAN right now, the materials that the folks in the room have in their kits on paper, you, if you have access to a computer right now, can take a look at at our website, allhealth.org, and there is a, uh, you can click on the briefing icon for today and get access to all of those materials. Um, now, I, I did mention that there, uh, there is a Twitter hashtag that you can use uh, if you are so inclined, uh, Medicaid third way, three being a numeral and not a word, so uh, feel free to do that if it is your want. Let, uh, let me start uh, uh, the, the presentations by turning to Dr. Joe Thompson, and we will give him the clicker so that his slides will align. Uh, Dr. Thompson is the Surgeon General of the State of Arkansas and Director of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement. His list of achievements, uh, both at the national and state levels, is both long and impressive, and highlighted by initiatives to combat childhood obesity and uh, the health threat of tobacco use. Now, back in Arkansas, he's worked with a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature uh, and was a leader in developing a, this creative alternative to Medicaid expansion that Sarah was alluding to under the Affordable Care Act. That alternative is now being carried out, and Dr. Thompson is here to tell us how it's going. Joe? Thank you, and thanks for being here today. First of all, if you're wondering who your state Surgeon General is, you probably don't have one. Uh, <laughs> there are only three states, actually Michigan, Florida, and Arkansas, that have utilized that aspect, uh, both for former Governor, uh, Republican Governor Mike Huckabee and now Democratic Governor Mike Beebe. Uh, they've asked me to serve as the lead cabinet-level strategic advisor. I don't run the health department. I don't run the Medicaid program. I just call it like I see it, and we end up where we are. Uh, so I look forward to sharing with you what has been an interesting past few years uh, as we have dealt with some of the opportunities or challenges that have come from Washington. Let me do a little bit of just kind of environmental assessment. Arkansas, as you may note, is in that more reddish tier of states, maybe purplish along the uh, uh, southern aspects of our nation. Uh, we have a Democratic governor. Uh, we have, for the first time two years ago since Reconstruction, elected a majority uh, Republican House and Senate. Uh, we have a low income level. Uh, we have a high uninsurance level. 25% of 19 to 64 year olds were uninsured, with some counties having more than 35% uninsured. Our health care system was fragmented, uh, predating the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and candidly, we were in a fairly significant sense of crisis. So I say all this to say our health care system was in jeopardy prior to the Affordable Care Act. I describe the Affordable Care Act as a disruptive act. Disruption is neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it that depends on whether you have a good outcome or a bad outcome. So I look forward to sharing with you uh, down the path. Uh, this, our uh, expansion of health insurance coverage uh, actually was not our initial foray. Uh, our system was in trouble, and we had actually previously started uh, to really ramp up our adoption of health information technology. Uh, for the first time, we had put a workforce strategic plan in place. Uh, we had actually worked in a multi-payer public and private effort to change the way we pay more for value-based outcomes so that we have our public and private payers, our two largest commercial carriers, Medicaid, Medicare in a limited way, our self-insured uh, state employees, public school employees, even some of our uh, self-insured private sector, Walmart, uh, corporate, as well as some of our other large self-insured companies had joined us in trying to change the way we paid. So we had dealt with, to a certain extent, the cost issue when along came the challenge of whether the state was going to expand health insurance coverage or not. 
This is a patchwork quilt that we've used locally to describe where Arkansas was. Um, income on the vertical axis, age across the uh, 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 x-axis, virtually everyone with Medicare when they hit 65. If you had a high enough paying job, you got private insurance from your place of employment. Uh, we had differentially invested in our children's health insurance program through our kids A and B so that we had over 60% of the kids on the Medicaid program. But if you were an adult and not disabled in our state, we had the leanest Medicaid program in the United States tied with Alabama. If you had no children and were not disabled, you were never eligible. If you had children, you had to make less than 17% of the poverty level and have less than two to $3,000 in assets. Uh, so we were very lean. Of our three million citizens, we estimated that there were about 550,000 uh, that lacked health insurance coverage. And again, this was a direct contribution to the fragility of our health care system, uh, the threat to our providers, and the poor health of our citizens. So going forward, uh, we had a political challenge. Not only did we have a new majority Republican House and Senate, but in our state, we have to get 75% of the House and Senate to vote each and every year to spend either a federal dollar or a state dollar. Uh, and along came the opportunity for a solution uh, but significant political resistance, as you're well aware of, uh, both within the state and nationally. We came up with an alternative to Medicaid expansion, commonly called the private option. Effectively, Medicaid, since its inception in 1965, has had two or three mechanisms to pay for care. Traditional fee-for-service payments from the state directly to providers, which was what Arkansas's primary care case management program continued to utilize. Other states had turned to outsource Medicaid managed care where they would put their clients up and ask managed care companies to bid for a Medicaid managed care book of business. A third, which was infrequently utilized but which was legally available, was premium assistance where if an individual worked for an employer that the benefit was at least as good as the Medicaid benefit and from a cost perspective, it was advantageous for the state on behalf of the state and the federal government to purchase private health insurance. It could use premium assistance to buy private health insurance coverage. The challenge was before the Affordable Care Act, employer-based health insurance was all over the map in what it covered and all over the map in what it cost. So it was prohibitive for any Medicaid program to effectively use that in a broad base. But with the establishment of the new health insurance exchanges, with the establishment of the new essential health benefit, with the standardization of the price structure, uh, we ended up exploring the use of premium assistance to buy individual private plans on the new health insurance marketplace. Uh, we identified the qualified high value silver policies as those that were most in alignment with the requirements for Medicaid and it has the essential health benefits with private provider payments. So not only did we get the Medicaid benefit covered, but instead of the differential with Medicaid payments too frequently being below the commercial rates, we were buying private health insurance that paid commercial rates. Now I'm giving you the nuts and the bolts. The political process was a little messier. Um, we ended up having big debate between the Democrats and the Republicans over whether to expand Medicaid, which took us from the floor up to 138%, was the right policy because between 100 and 138 percent, if we expanded Medicaid, we took away the right of an individual to use their tax credit and buy private health insurance coverage. So this was the threat between do we take away somebody's option to buy private health insurance coverage with a tax credit or do we end up with upside down policy where we're offering federal support for higher income individuals and not using funds for our Medicaid program. Our solution using premium assistance in the private market garnered enough support all the Democratic support and a majority of the Republican support in both House and Senate to actually reach that 75% bar and put the private option in place. It's funded via the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this is using the Medicaid funds in the Affordable Care Act with pre-existing options for premium assistance in the Medicaid program to buy private coverage. A majority of the newly insured are placed with private carriers. This is not a Medicaid managed care, we are placing them in the same plans that somebody making $90,000 a year is receiving care through. Um, medically frail individuals, those that have wraparound service needs or might otherwise be better served or retained in the traditional Medicaid program. Some of our existing Medicaid beneficiaries that had less than a full benefit package, for example, those on family planning or those with breast and cervical cancer coverage only are better served and will be transitioned into the full benefit package of the commercial sector. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, it required a waiver of select federal Medicaid requirements. Our waiver requirements actually were not a waiver to use the private option. It actually were threefold. One is we had to get a waiver to not require 24-hour access to drugs. The commercial standard is 72. We had to get a waiver to require people, if they wanted coverage, to go into the private sector and not stay in the traditional Medicaid program. And we had to get a waiver to uh, uh, be able to pay provider rates in the commercial marketplace as opposed to the traditional Medicaid lower cost or lower uh, uh, payment reimbursement rate. So those were our waivers. And again, each and every year we've got to get bipartisan support with 75% approval in the midst of the political discourse, which is anything other than constructive. This is where we're going. Our plan is uh, the 550,000 individuals. We think in the gray scale at the top, they'll get a sliding scale tax credit, increasingly supportive down to 138% of the poverty level. And in the new red zone, we are going to have tiers there where individuals have cost sharing above 100% and in the future below 100% so that they also have some engagement in the financial well-being of their plan and responsibility for their service delivery. One of the issues that we had is we have a relatively non-competitive insurance market, and was this a mechanism that we could improve the competition of our insurance market? Uh, these are the seven divisions of our state into the insurance markets. The large numbers are the number of carriers in each of the markets. We have at least two carriers in every market, four carriers in some. And as a uh, comparison, Mississippi across the uh, uh, river from us who chose not to expand Medicaid or actively participate had 36 counties that no insurance carrier offered at all on the insurance exchange. So we think we have achieved some of the competitive aspects. Uh, we have our providers reporting uh, significant reductions in uncompensated care in the first three months of this year compared to the first three months a year ago. And probably most importantly are some of the personal stories coming through whereby individuals are either addressing uh, life-threatening illnesses that they knew they had or are getting new diagnoses uh, that they did not know they had because they'd not uh, uh, covered th their care before. Some of the pent-up demand we saw initially was not uh, as people provided in, in critical access problems in the primary care area. We actually saw most of the pent-up demand in prescriptions that had been previously written but never filled. And so in the first week of January, people who knew they had a condition, had seen the doctor in one way or another, gotten the prescription, suddenly had a financial barrier lifted and they started actively taking part in their care going forward. This is where we are. We are a state federal exchange. The red bar here are the individuals that have come across uh, from the uh, healthcare.gov site, 44,000 folks. Uh, the blue entry point is our state portal. We have 155,000 folks that have come through there. You'll remember each of these groups has about a 250,000 denominator. So we're about uh, two thirds of the way on the Medicare CAID side. Uh, we're less than uh, one fifth of the way on the private health insurance exchange. We've kept 16,000 out as medically frail. We've put 121,000 in, so we have 166,000 of the 550,000 people covered now in the marketplace. Required to have a significant waiver evaluation, four major efforts. Uh, uh, do we achieve better access in health care compared to what we would have done had we had a traditional Medicaid uh, expansion? 74 out of 75 counties are a medically underserved area, so I think with the commercial approach, we probably will succeed in that. Will we get better care and outcomes? Uh, importantly, the third one, will we have continuity of coverage? So that as people go to re-enroll and or their income fluctuates, we have them in the same plan that they can stay in with the same doctor. All we're doing is flipping who's paying the switch. It's the exact same plan, the exact same coverage, the exact same provider network. And of course, importantly, in the next two and a half years, we'll have to assess whether it was cost effective to actually utilize the commercial sector as a delivery system point. So with that, let me close, look forward to questions. Uh, I don't know that my contact information is in your uh, uh, list, but it's there on the bottom should you have questions after today. Thank you for having me. Steve? Terrific, thank you very much, Joe. <clears throat> We're gonna turn uh, next to Steve Fitton. Uh, uh, Steve has directed Michigan's Medicaid and CHIP programs for more than five years now, and he headed the policy and financing activity for those programs before that. He's a career civil servant operating, I guess, in a completely non-political environment. After all, it's only, what, 15 billion out of uh, 50 billion dollar state budget, so it's uh, hardly noticeable, right? Uh, Steve has a story to tell about how Michigan is extending coverage to hundreds of thousands of lower income residents through its Healthy Michigan program, and we're glad you came to share it with us. Steve? 
Thank you, Ed. I wondered how he was going to introduce a career bureaucrat, so it's very kind. In any case, I am pleased to be here to share with you some of the high points of the process to pass and implement the Healthy Michigan legislation. Um, the Michigan political environment, our legislature, both House and Senate, is, is Republican at this point and was during the passage of the legislation, and the governor is a Republican, Governor Snyder. And so where we started was to make the case that the Michigan Medicaid program is, was and is effective and that the fundamentals are sound and in a lot of ways we um, are you know, near the front of the line in terms of how Medicaid programs operate. And this is really to counter what was the commonly held notion and what is, I think, a commonly held notion in some, in some segments that the Medicaid program is broken and all you're doing is putting more people into a broken system and it's a false promise because it's a card and you can't get services. And so we really um, set out to uh, get the story straight in terms of Michigan and the fact that we had data to counter those um, concerns. In fact, we can show that we have access and quality in the program. Well, as you can imagine, the conversation isn't exactly a linear conversation, so there was lots of attention to other states and what was going on nationally and what might Michigan do differently as we were making the case that at least we were starting from a good place. And so we would get comments like, why don't you do what Florida is doing and privatize the program? So we'd say, well, actually, we did that in 1997. So 17 years ago, we privatized the Michigan Medicaid program, in case you weren't paying attention. And um, that's been done. So we don't, don't have that place to go. So we started to have a conversation about where we were, where we fit nationally. Um, in, on, on some of these dimensions in terms of program design and structure. And we're able to point to a number of features in terms of where the program stacked up nationally. We have six of, the, six of our 13 HMOs are in the top 20 Medicaid HMOs nationally, according to NCQA. We have metrics that show we do provide access to care just in terms of visit rates because we have the data. And we're able to show that we were effective from a financial standpoint. So we shared this slide with them that showed that there had been an increase in health insurance premiums on the private side, commercial side, of 127% over this 12-year period, while the Medicaid program had gone up 31%. And Medicare, I think, during the same time period went up 94% to show that we had been able to be effective in terms of holding the cost of care down. And it was largely due to our managed care strategy, but it was also due to the fact that we had volume purchase programs for eyeglasses. We started in the 80s. We have a, started a multi-state purchasing consortium with Vermont, but it's now grown to 10 states in the District of Columbia to hold pharmacy purchasing costs down. So we're able to point, I think, to a solid track record. And we also had data on um, quality. So this shows the percentage of women who get a prenatal visit in the first um, trimester or within 42 days of enrollment in the program. So both clinical and access and quality measures, and we had them in, in great volume, and I won't bore you with them. So the path to legislative enactment really starts with the fact, well, it was a lengthy process. We started with the budget presentation from the governor in late January, early February, and ended up um, actually having this last until the end of August, and the legislation wasn't even signed until um, early September. But I think you start with the fact that, you need, that we need to give credit to the governor. The governor was all in on this. He was fully committed. He went around the state doing town halls. He was convinced of the economic argument. And obviously, you can't ignore the impact of the really deep recession in Michigan over the last decade, far earlier than other states had experienced. And so that's, that's partly what's in play here. But I think the govern, governor, governor also was moved by the various stories he heard of people that were uninsured and the impact it had on their lives. And so. He was a strong advocate, as was my boss, uh, the community health director, Jim Haveman. So, I th and I think as we engaged with the legislators, there was intense interest and in, on the key parties in terms of understanding and improving the program. We got pretty good buy-in for the discussion and ultimately were able to get the bill passed at the end of August or so. The, the political and policy issues, um, essentially there's a lot to talk about, and there was a lot to talk about. And so because healthcare is such a large part of the economy, a lot of it did have to do with financing and economics. Uh, uncompensated care costs have been growing rather dramatically in the state, and our rate of employer-financed insurance had dropped from the high 70 percent, which was very good, the beginning of the last decade to somewhere around low 60s. So we lost between 15 and 20 percent of employer-financed insurance. So people were losing coverage, uncompensated care was growing, 
a lot of interest on the part of business in terms of the Small Business Association and the Chamber. And so a lot of focus and some focus specifically in the legislation on uncompensated care, the impact on uncompensated care, and then the impact that that would have on private health insurance premiums. And so there's a lot of focus on the economic aspects, I think it's fair to say. We also emphasize the fact that it's not a static situation. If you don't do this, the world will not stay the same. That The needles have been moving and they will keep moving as the costs go up and you can see as private commercial insurance had gone up 127% in cost, employers are being priced out of the market. I think a lot of people understood that, both from being exposed to it and then just looking at the data. And so we got traction there. And then there was a lot of health policy to talk about, and it's, I think, a pretty transformative time. So we have the largest demonstration for um, patient-centered medical homes in the country, um, big emphasis on that, and trying to transform the health system and the way it operates. And so and how to engage consumers, another topic. At any rate, a range of topics that were on the policy side that there was deep engagement. So the themes of Healthy Michigan are, really there are quite a number of them and the legislation is quite long and it touches a whole, whole bunch of fronts, if you will. Um, certainly there was reinforcement of the managed care approach that we've had in place in Michigan since 1997, which included in 1997 mandatory enrollment of the disabled population, which I think was very early for, uh, among the various states in terms of doing that. Um, but there's also a look at incentives beyond just the health savings account notion or health savings account like notion, as well as co-pays, but alignment of incentives so that beneficiaries, providers, and health plans were all push, pushing in the same direction. There is a heavy consumer engagement piece in this, both in terms of finances and skin in the game, but also in terms of healthy behaviors and really trying to find ways in which we can make the population of Michigan healthier. We have a high obesity rate in Michigan. Um, we, we don't do very well on some many broad measures, and we're really looking for ways to move the needle there. Um, and we're actually doing a dual, dual eligibles demo. Um, so we had an MOU signed recently, and there was reinforcement of that. So reinforcement of the managed care approach, and then a whole bunch of measures of accountability, a lot of reports that are required. I accuse the legislators of wanting to beef up the bureaucracy. In any case, um, and just the health plan incentives, which had been limited to 0.19% of total premium previously on the Medicaid side, that was the biggest we could make the incentive pool. This legislation moves it to 0.75%, so a much bigger pool of incentives and the notion that financial incentives are important across the system, health plans, providers, beneficiaries. The consumer engagement piece um, does get attention and rightfully so. And this is the place where we did need a waiver from the federal government. There are required contributions or premiums, if you like, of 2% of income, but only for those who are over 100% of the federal poverty level. Uh, there are co-pays that would apply, will apply to the entire population. And we do want to engage the consumer by showing what the care costs and think that's a useful endeavor. And so we'll be sending out quarterly statements showing what those services are and what the dollars are that are tied to them. But there's also a heavy piece in terms of healthy behaviors. We're requiring a health risk assessment, or not requiring it, but it's going to be heavily incentivized on both the provider and on the beneficiary side in terms of getting people to go through that process, to being informed and encouraged to do healthy behaviors, and then being rewarded for engaging in those healthy behaviors. And I think I have to say, there's an awful lot to learn here. Um, and we look at this as a learning process because if you look at the experience on the commercial side, you see nobody's quite figured out how to, how to uh, manage this effectively. That there, there, it's a, there's a lot going on in the commercial sector, but it looks like there's a lot to learn yet and a lot of tweaking in terms of the models that are being used. So the implementation itself, we didn't get immediate effect in the legislation, and in fact, the legislation passed the Senate 20 to 18, and there weren't enough senators to get the two-thirds majority to get immediate effect, so we ended up implementing on April 1st. Um, we did a lot of preparation in terms of the IT systems to make sure eligibility was going to work, and we really weren't willing to pull the trigger even on the April 1 eligibility date until we had the testing done and had that uh, accomplished. Um, but you do find out in government that most of these jobs, no matter where you um, find yourself on the ideological spectrum, are about execution. You have to execute effectively in order 
um, for the programs to work, and it really does affect how people perceive the programs. And so we had a lot of focus on that. We've done very well, frankly. We've had the system in maybe a third to a half of the cases be able to determine eligibility with no human hands, no human intervention. It's all done electronically, and 15 seconds after they complete the, elect the electronic application, they get a message back that you're approved for Healthy Michigan, so you're eligible instantly. And it's really um, been, a, been a big, um, big plus for folks in terms of the reaction, a very affirmative reaction on the part of the, the beneficiaries who are applying. And I think the last thing I want to say is that there is tremendous potential for improvement in areas that we're really just starting to understand. So we know that there are a lot of individuals in the corrections system that have behavioral health issues. We know that we're confident that at least some of that can be addressed and we can reduce the number of persons in our corrections system. And so there's there's areas to focus on there. There's certainly areas to focus on in terms of high utilizers and healthy behaviors. So we, we have a lot that we're digging into, a lot to learn, but a lot to really engage in and uh, what I think is very worth, or it's gonna be a very worthwhile endeavor. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, finally, we're gonna hear from Alan Weil. He's director of the National Academy for State Health Policy, or NASHP. He's been that for, what, almost a decade. Uh, for those of you who don't know NASHB, uh, it is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research and policy organization dedicated to excellence in state health policy and practice. How's that? Uh, in a prior life, Alan directed the Colorado Department of Healthcare and Policy and Financing. He was health policy advisor to the Colorado governor, Roy Romer. He's one of the most thoughtful policy analysts around, a quality you're going to be able to see more clearly perhaps uh, very soon by reading the journal Health Affairs where he's about to take over as editor-in-chief. And today we've asked Alan to give us a broader view of the possible expansion choices that states have faced and are in some cases still facing when looking at the Medicaid expansion opportunities. Alan? Thank you, Ed, and uh, the Commonwealth Fund for uh, putting this event on. Uh, I titled my s segment, What Does It Take to Get to Yes? Because I think the overarching theme here is you have to want to do this to make it happen. And you're hearing, uh, you've heard uh, examples of two states that are doing so. Um, and what is the yes that you need? It's a waiver, uh, Section 1115 waiver under the Social Security Act. And uh, I always start with the uh, the original text to understand what uh, this uh, what this environment is about, and to remind you that a waiver is available in the case of any experimental pilot or demonstration project, which, in the judgment of the secretary, is likely to assist in promoting the objectives of titles, various titles, including Title 19. Uh, focus for a moment on experimental pilot or demonstration. This is not plenary waiver authority. It is. Uh, it has to be tied to a learning uh, opportunity. Uh, there is that word judgment of the secretary that states sometimes bristle at. It's not the judgment of the governor or the state legislature. It is the governor of the secretary. And uh, it does need to be tied to promoting the objectives of the law. Uh, despite the changes in the enforcement opportunities for states after uh, the Supreme Court's ruling on the Affordable Care Act, the Medicaid expansion still resides in the federal Medicaid statute, and so it's pretty clearly the objective of Title 19 to have everyone uh, with incomes below 133% of poverty covered. And then the question is, how do you go about doing it? I remind you, there's a, there are a lot of meetings about this uh, third way or whatever we want to call it, but it is worth remembering that the vast majority of states that have expanded uh, Medicaid have done so uh, the old-fashioned way, which uh, for a state administrator is called with a state plan amendment. You just tell the federal government you're going to do it, and it happens. Um, and so the question, I think, for today is why might a waiver, which is a lot harder to get, uh, be an appropriate mechanism from a state and federal perspective to effectuate a Medicaid expansion? And again, I want to remind you, the state has to request it and the federal government has to approve it. So both parties to the deal have to believe that a waiver is more appropriate here than a garden variety Medicaid expansion. And tying back to the language of experiment, pilot, or demonstration, there has to be some kind of learning going on. We have to be finding something out that we didn't know before. 
Uh, I would loosely place it in four categories of learning. There's overlap among these, but I think given the way the program operates, it's a decent starting place. A lot of times we want to know how carriers or uh, healthcare providers are going to react to a certain change, the, the shape of the market and the shape of the delivery system. Uh, we're certainly very interested in knowing how people's access to care, utilization of care, uh, changes based on program parameters. There's a good deal of interest in engaging the Medicaid enrollees, and we want to know how they'll respond to certain circumstances. And of course, I put it last, but it's really often first, which is, will any of this save us any money? And so what I'm going to do in just a few minutes is try to pull out examples of these four kinds of questions which animate uh, the approaches that states are taking to, to use a waiver method instead of a, a standard uh, plan amendment. Well, if we start with carriers and providers, we're very interested in what the states you've heard from uh, are experimenting with and others are interested in is trying to understand if you consolidate the Medicaid and the exchange insurance markets, uh, what the effects will be. Uh, traditionally, these have been very separate markets. Um, you've had Medicaid plans, you've had commercial plans. With the exchange, even without a, a, a third-way Medicaid expansion, with the exchange, we've already started to see in states some of the plans on the exchange, depending on the state, are traditional commercial carriers. Some of them are traditional Medicaid carriers. This boundary is beginning to blur. Why have these markets been separate? Well, partly they operate under very different rules. And partly uh, the commercial plans in particular have always felt that there were a lot of benefits in Medicaid that they didn't know how to administer. And so it was sort of a special area of expertise to be able to operate in the Medicaid world. Well, with the essential health uh, benefits redefining the Medicaid package in the Medicaid expansion, and with the exchange uh, putting a, a, a changing the structure of the entire market, uh, there are a lot of questions now about whether or not if you bring these two markets together, uh, who will participate? On what terms will they participate? How eager will they be uh, to participate? As Joe described, will you get new entrants into the market uh, relative to the world you've been in? I should say these are very interesting questions. They're also very dependent on what the market looked like before you did a Medicaid expansion. And so figuring out a research question here uh, is very dependent on uh, knowing where you started. What about the area of access and utilization? It's uh, commonly uh, expressed that there's a concern about uh, access to providers for people on Medicaid. And Steve's comments about the data notwithstanding, it's still a broadly held view that Medicaid uh, doesn't provide as good access as other sources. So uh, as, as Joe's described in Arkansas, and other states are certainly interested in the question, uh, if you have uh, the same provider network in Medicaid and the exchange, will access and utilization uh, change? Will they improve? And I think it is, again, um, a commonly held view that more access to the commercial market will improve access and utilization for people on Medicaid. But I should say that we don't actually know that. Uh, we know that many uh, Medicaid providers have invested a lot in uh, culturally competent care, geographically available care, uh, linkages to social services that people might need that commercial carriers historically have not. Um, and so the question of whether uh, bringing everyone into the same network will improve access and utilization, it's a, it's a great question to ask, um, but this is why we have to ask it, because we actually don't know the answer. We may think we know the answer, but we don't. Similarly, uh, traditionally, there's been a big gap between what commercial carriers uh, provide in benefits and what Medicaid provides. Now that's uh, been greatly narrowed with the essential benefits package, but we still have these so-called wraparound benefits. And the question here is whether you can really make wraparound benefits work. Uh, we don't have a lot of good experience uh, on that front. And so if you're going to bring these markets together, you have to wonder whether or not people will get the care uh, that they are entitled to if it's not delivered through their uh, major plan. And uh, there's certainly been some efforts on the parts of states to exclude certain benefits from the Medicaid package. Uh, CMS has been less open to that, but it's just the opposite side of the RAP question of whether or not uh, excluding certain benefits has an effect on people's ability to get uh, care. Many questions about Medicaid enrollees' responses to incentives and changes in the delivery system. Uh, these, uh, some of these have already been mentioned by our 
our speakers. Uh, how will Medicaid enrollees respond to having a choice of plan within the exchange? Not all of the states that are trying this, um, this so-called private option are, are extending that choice to the enrollee, but some are. So will, can people navigate choice in the exchange? How will that differ from navigating across plans in Medicaid? Uh, a good deal of discussion already about financial incentives for wellness. Um, CMS has never been particularly interested in taking benefits away from people. We don't, uh, we don't need a lot of research on whether or not utilization goes down when you eliminate benefits or increase cost sharing. We, we, we know that. Uh, the question then is, can we encourage people to do something different uh, through some of these wellness approaches? And I think a, a common thread across states that are pursuing this alternative method is that they want to try out different ways to engage uh, the patients, but not just through garden variety, higher cost sharing. Uh, speaking of cost sharing, it, it is not lost on states that there's a misalignment in the cost sharing provisions between Medicaid and the exchange for people between 100 and 138 percent of poverty. Uh, in, in, uh, it, traditionally in Medicaid, you couldn't uh, extend cost sharing, but the exchanges, uh, the statute is written with uh, premiums down to 100 percent of poverty. So there's a lot of interest in what happens with cost sharing in that uh, income range, and I think we'll learn about that from these states. And finally, uh, it's not often discussed, but most of these, uh, actually I believe all the states, uh, are excluding some people from their demonstrations based on some sort of a health screen. Uh, how effective will those be? And if we take those people out of the risk pool for the, the mainstream exchange plans, will we achieve the savings we thought we were going to save? Uh, I don't think we uh, know the answers to these questions yet, but it would, it would be good to find them out and to find out what kind of health screen really works. And of course, there's the question of saving money. Uh, a, a, a big a plus, as described earlier, is the possibility of less churn, but less churn only happens if people actually do move seamlessly across different sources of coverage, and it's not at all obvious that just because the same plans are offered on the exchange and in Medicaid, that people will actually move from Medicaid to the exchange or vice versa when their income changes. So we need to actually find out whether there is less churn and if it does yield benefits. Is this more effective at, uh, at uh, providing stability than some state's bridge plans or a basic health program? We, we don't know yet. Uh, similarly, there's a big hope that when you put everyone in the same network that we reduce uh, cost shifting, uh, that we cover more people and that the prices for private coverage will go down. Uh, economists aren't so sure. Uh, people who uh, run hospitals and health plans are sure. Uh, here's our chance to find out. And finally, uh, again, a lot of interest in these uh, behavioral incentives associated to, uh, with financing. So these are the kinds of questions you have to, if a state is interested in, a, in, in going forward, not with the standard state plan amendment, these questions in the form of some kind of a demonstration or pilot need to be built in. Uh, otherwise, you're not really doing what Section 1115 uh, calls for. So I would just conclude by noting that the, the I like the catchy title of the third way, uh, but we should be aware that there isn't just one third way. Each of these states and the others that are having this discussion have a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh way. Um, and that the differences, which are often at the level of detail, are in many instances profound. Uh, but the advantage of the having those differences is that from a research pilot and demonstration perspective, uh, we'll learn a lot more, which is uh, what Section 1115 is all about. Terrific. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, good framing of the broader issues as well. Now we get a chance for you to join the conversation. As I mentioned, there are microphones you can use to ask your question verbally. If you do that, I'd appreciate your being as brief as you can and as questiony as you can and identify yourself as to your organizational affiliation, if any. And I would invite uh, our panelists who might want to question each other to offer uh, similar questions and certainly Sarah, join in as we speak. And if you have a question to be written down, hold the green card up and someone will bring it forward. There is a gentleman at the microphone, as they used to say. Thanks, Ed. Um, Mike Miller, I'm a former orthopedic surgeon, but now a health policy wonk, I guess. You want to stand um, closer to the microphone, Mike? Sorry, Ed, I'm getting over a cold. Um, Mike Miller, I'm a former orthopedic surgeon, been health policy wonk for 25 years. I, I wanted to ask Steve about his last slide, uh, the one that says questions. And I'm wondering what kind of, for Steve and Joe, what kind of 
questions do you hope to be able to have answered in the next six to nine months that maybe you'll be able to, um, we'll know the answers for about the operations or making your, your waivers work that are more operational rather than the kind of questions that Alan asked in his slides, which will relate to the effectiveness of meeting the waivers demonstration pilot characteristics. So things that you're, you're maybe keeping you up at night and you're hoping to know how to do better or hope they work out or figure out as you go forward. Does that make sense? So I'll start. We, we uh, affectionately call those that list, which is not a short list of issues, our transition to market issues. We are marrying two different approaches that are philosophically and operationally very different. Uh, the insurance world, uh, where you have no coverage until you pay your premium and the Medicaid world where you have coverage immediately upon eligibility, the insurance world where you uh, have had different levels of cost sharing and, 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 and variation in um, uh, management efforts, the Medicaid world that had a fairly uh, uh, regulated approach from the federal government. So I would actually say our biggest challenge, and it continues, we, we are managing through it. Uh, we meet every Monday afternoon obviously not today, for a couple of hours between the leadership of our insurance department and the exchange and our leadership of our human services department and the Medicaid to go down a list of 20, 25 different operational issues as we marry two federal agencies, SOSIO and the Center for Medicaid uh, program, and two state agencies, the insurance department and the Medicaid program. It's a four-way relationship and you can only imagine the complications of the different rules, regulations, and philosophical orientation for each of those four perspectives. I think for us, there, there are a couple areas of focus. One has to do with the engagement with the consumer. So maybe number one is, can we figure out a way that they can pay their required contributions and co-pays, and will they? And so first we have to set up a structure and we've talked to Walmart and Meyer, which is a big chain in Michigan, to see if we could actually create the process for them to, to take in cash, for instance, and credit to the account without um, charging us a huge transaction fee. So we're trying to figure out whether we can make those mechanics work and then to see how folks will respond on the health behavior side, just to see if individuals will complete the health risk appraisal or assessment and and then that's two-sided. It also has to do with the primary care providers that we need to engage with. And the early returns are they're being completed at a rate we didn't foresee possible even in these first five or six weeks. So we're kind of amazed that that seems to be actually going well in terms of early returns. And then lastly, I think we will start to see some data on uncompensated care and what the impact is, particularly on the hospital sector. I, I don't think we'll know much about private insurance premiums in six to nine months, but I think we will start to see some data on uncompensated care and see what the impact is there, and that's obviously very interesting to us. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. Um, my question is about the premiums in the insurance. My understanding from what you said is that you're going to use Medicaid money to pay the premiums um, for private insurance with some co-pays or something, or a small contribution. Um, do you negotiate with the insurance companies about the premiums? Um, I would imagine that um, CMS will only give you so much money per capita uh, for private insurance premiums. And obviously people below 140% of the poverty line aren't going to be able to contribute very much. So this is one of the open questions. The insurance exchanges are newly formed this year. Uh, the premium price point for the new essential health benefit had never been experienced before. So the carriers came in with price points on premium this year for a product that had never been sold in the marketplace. Right. Obviously over time we will introduce cost competition for the Medicaid dollar Mine doesn't like us for some reason. Uh, uh, so, so first year in, uh, the uh, price point competition is really largely uh, uh, guarded by the medical loss ratio requirement in the uh, uh, individual marketplace. Over time, as a large state purchaser, we will likely introduce some price competition so that we'll buy 
the, the second lowest plan plus a percent of premium, which is the same strategy that the Federal Health Insurance Exchange will use uh, for what is applied to the tax credit. Right, but what if there isn't much price competition, or what if all the prices turn out to be higher than what CMS will give you for Medicaid? They're not gonna pay more for a Medicaid patient in Arkansas or Michigan than they pay for a Medicaid patient in New York. Well, they currently do pay dramatically different prices for Medicaid patients between different states. Um, our demonstration waiver is to actually test whether the purchase of the private premium is worth the increased access and uh, outcomes and continuity of care that we anticipate. Uh, so that, that is the pilot project, to use uh, Alan's demonstration perspective, and they are allowing us to have a differential payment to test that pilot. Thank you. You know, uh, there is actually, a, I'd like to follow that up just to clarify for those of us who don't immerse ourselves in Medicaid every day. Uh, Alan noted that uh, there's always a high interest in trying to explore potential savings in moving to this kind of a system, and yet uh, Medicaid rates, though they vary obviously a great deal from state to state, are generally perceived to be well below commercial rates. So how, by moving from a Medicaid program to a commercial program, can you expect to save money? Alan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're asking me. Um, well, I, uh, what you spend is uh, price times volume, and uh, one answer is that you might imagine that with better access to care, particularly access to things like care that uh, better manages chronic conditions or uh, diverts people from high-end institutional services that, uh, that you would bring the cost down. The original move of Medicaid from fee-for-service into managed care, uh, where states were required to show five, minimum 5% 5 savings relative to fee-for-service was based exactly on that premise that you would drive down uh, high cost volume. Uh, and, and certainly the, uh, I, I I think the data have been hard to find because in many instances they're proprietary, but if you talk to those who run the Medicaid managed care plans, they will tell you that they jack up the rates on the front end on primary care to try to uh, reduce that utilization, and that's their winning formula. So that's, uh, that's one answer. The other answer is uh, maybe it won't. And, um, and uh, it, it is, I, it, or one might ask, um, if the solution to our problems is paying higher rates, uh, do you need a model like this to solve that problem? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, the answer is we don't really know, but there certainly is a, uh, there's a hypothesis out there uh, that, that, you, uh, that is worth testing, but it's, it's a hypothesis that extends well beyond the, the uh, private option expansion. If, yep. if I could just add, um, our, our, Medicaid rates, we believe, would have been, had to have been substantially increased to actually gain the access that newly covered lives would have because of it, uh, Ed, as you suggested. The other piece that we've already seen is that we anticipate that by uh, reducing dramatically the number of the uninsured that we will eliminate some of the cost shift that's going on within the private sector. And although I think it was premature, one of our larger carriers actually introduced a 10% reduction on specialty rates across the board uh, as we implemented essentially an offload of the uncompensated care. That didn't stick because we didn't have people already covered, but I think there will be uh, potential deflationary pressure across the market as we eliminate some of the cost shifts on the uncompensated care on the private market. Steve, any experience uh, in the month and a week that you've been in business? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, reflect more on the conversation we had in Michigan, and that was as we engaged with the legislature, and you know, we had a lot of parties to this discussion, but the, the question of you know, the 100% threshold was very important. It was important in Arkansas. I think it's important in a lot of the states that are sort of in the middle. And the fact that you know, the private insurance option was viewed as preferential from a philosophical standpoint. But what we ended up talking about was what is the total cost to government, whether it's federal or state, and we were able to make the case effectively enough in Michigan that we were below the private market and in fact more effective than the private market and therefore that the government would spend less if we did 
indeed have Medicaid and healthy Michigan going up to 138% of poverty. So, and we're, we're gonna be held to that in terms of looking at what is the, what is the total cost and how might that have played against what the, um, the exchange prices are. And in fact, we've already had to do a preliminary analysis that shows that we're, we're below where the exchange is. But we essentially did what we did because the assumption is it's cheaper to government, cheaper to government to run it through the Medicaid system. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Seth Gold. I'm with the uh, Men's Health Network. And I have a question for Mr. Thompson. In regards to assessments that you do in Arkansas for um, newly enrolled Medicaid patients, we were wondering if you, if you have some form of programs like Michigan has with the healthy benefits, kind of trying to assess what chronic diseases um, patients might have just so that you catch them early and want to see if there's something you guys are actively doing to ensure that. Sure, great question. Uh, many of our carriers are actually either already implementing or in the process of developing essentially early sc uh, screening mechanisms to try to get case management and support on these newly insured individuals. If you've had no experience before, there's no record of what your issue is, so there's an obvious benefit to the carrier to better manage those uh, uh, costs. The other um, reflection on, on your question that I, that I would say is uh, there is discussion around our independence accounts, which are not dissimilar to, to uh, uh, Steve's uh, health savings accounts approach that I think in the out years there will be expectations for healthy behavior requirements, other contributions in certain ways that, that increase the individual's first awareness. I don't know that many of these people have the awareness of what the contributing factors are to their illness and over time fiscal uh, uh, accountability for those issues. Hi, uh, Joan Alker with Georgetown University, and I had a Michigan question. Um, we found your authorizing legislation super complicated to understand, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your health accounts, which I think are really the unique feature, and in particular, uh, I know you're gonna be looking at sort of six-month periods of utilization for beneficiaries and then you know revising their cost sharing based on um, some of their practices. So I know you haven't fully gotten there yet, but can you tell us a little bit more about where you're on implementation and how that's gonna work? Sure, the, the part of the legislation that is referred to here has to do with the fact that we wanted to take the copay responsibility off of the provider. It was alleged that that's just a, a fee reduction to the provider because of the difficulty in collecting copays and so the legislation calls for accumulating experience over a six month period and then spreading the copay obligation out to be collected in the next six months where it's prorated across the different months. And so we're um, working hard to operationalize that. I don't know how happy the staff are that that's the structure we've adopted because it gets tricky in terms of what happens if people go off the program in various ways and are you gonna to continue to pursue them because you're really collecting after the fact. Um, so we're wrestling with the, you know, a lot of those um, logistical challenges and, um, but we're, you know, we're working toward it and essentially trying to set up apparatus to make those collections after the fact and they'll be spread out in an even way so we think it might be more affordable and it does reduce the burden on the provider. So that'll be one of the interesting things to see how well we can make that work. Hi, I'm Sue Latacina with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. I'd like to ask our panelists to look ahead in the future a little bit. Uh, could you in get Arkansas, closer to the microphone? In just, Ar if you in could Arkansas, just get a little closer to the microphone, that'd be great. Is that good? That's terrific. Okay, Thanks. great. Um, in Arkansas, when do you anticipate the uh, exchange will uh, move, transition to a fully state-based exchange? Would it be in time for the 2015 uh, annual enrollment to begin? And in Michigan, when do you anticipate the state would have the legal authority and to move to first a, a more of a partnership exchange and then eventually to a state-based exchange? So we, we had the political experience of not wanting to have anything, so we were a federal exchange, and then the Fed said, well, we don't really want it, so now we're a state-federal partnership exchange. Uh, I actually don't think we could have done our private option if the state had not had control over the plan management function to be able to marry the Medicaid program and the, and the private uh, marketplace. 
in some of the legislation uh, uh, surrounding the private option legislation was the establishment of an independent health marketplace board that I think likely will uh, advocate to move from a federal state partnership to a state only exchange, probably not before calendar year 2016. I think the timing is too tight to get to calendar year 2015. The exchange isn't exactly in my wheelhouse, but I guess what I would say is this. Both the House and the Senate at different times um, chose not to act in an affirmative way on either a state-based exchange or a partnership exchange. And at this point, I don't know what the political will would be. I know that there's some regrets in some quarters that, they, that we didn't move forward with that, but um, sort of an open question, and I'm not really sure. Um, you know, what, what the future will hold, but I, I don't see anything in the short term that we want to move. Okay. Push the button to a, to a state-based exchange. I think we had one more person who was in line before this gentleman was in line. Thank you. Um, I had kind of a two-pronged question. The first is you about- You want to identify yourself? Sure, I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Katie Allen. I come from Congressman Burgess's office. Um, so I have a two-pronged question. The first is about enrollment, the risk pool. Um, I know particularly in the private option in Arkansas, and this is sort of specific to the dem demographics of Arkansas, but it's the vast majority of enrollees are in the Medicaid population. Um, you also have a pretty significant portion of your um, enrollment coming from your high risk pool. Um, so how is this affecting overall risk and rates? And then the second portion is the private option seems to be removing a lot of the cost controls inherent in traditional Medicaid programs. Um, so how is this kind of marry to increase cost in state and federal budgets? So, so excellent question. Let me just set up the answer to the first. So if you'll remember on my slides, roughly there were about 200 to 250,000 that could be newly eligible for Medicaid and about the same amount that could be newly eligible for the tax credits. We're about 160,000 into the Medicaid and we're only about 45,000 into the tax credits. Uh, you allude to two previous high-risk pools, one that the state had run, one that the, federal, that the Affordable Care Act established that were terminated, and those individuals are probably in the 44,000 and contributing to some adverse risk selection uh, of our tax credits. We also had our legislature uh, prohibit any state agency from doing outreach or enrollment into the Affordable Care Act, so we're not, our uptake is not great on the exchange. However, our Medicaid eligibles that we're buying private uh, coverage for are drawing down the risk pool so that Arkansas's risk pool is on average 10 years younger than every other state's risk pool. The only risk pool that has an exchange that's younger than ours is yours here in the District of Columbia because all of you young people are in that risk pool. Uh, but but we, are, we are buying down by 10 years our younger, poorer people into the risk pool so we actually have an advantageous risk pool uh, uh, compared to almost every other state. Now with respect to the cost controls, I think that's part of our, our demonstration. Uh, we were a, uh, still a fee-for-service uh, uh, primary care case management state. Uh, we had lots of uh, administrative efforts to have cost controls, including uh, 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 lower payment rates. The question is going to be, can we get improved care, access, and outcomes uh, for a marginal cost of using the commercial uh, sector. And what I think we're, we're already starting to hear from some of our commercial sector is that original actuarial projection may have been a little high because of perceived adverse risk, and they may end up bringing that in at a lower rate in future years that will help both the state's obligation and over time because of the tax credits that the federal government's paying into the risk pool, potentially the federal obligation also. So, Joe, I just want to follow up, too, on um, the administrative costs. A question came in on how the administrative cost is going to be affected um, by, by doing the private option. So I would say that, that our legislature was very interested that we did not grow state government because of the private option. So almost all of the administrative costs are transferred over in the premium price point that we're paying for the carrier. So the administrative costs are in the premium price uh, I, I can't say that there's not administrative effort that's being expended, but in terms of uh, no new state employees, no new administrative costs, uh, we're buying the premium assistance and the administration of the plan, the production of the cards, the appeals process, the uh, formulary management, 
uh, all of that effort is transitioned over to the commercial carriers as part of their commercial obligation. It is ruled by commercial rules. The appeals process is the commercial appeals process. Uh, so all of that now factors under the insurance department's uh, authority and oversight. Alan? I just want to comment on the uh, part of the question about cost control, which I would actually transform slightly into cost and quality oversight. Um, and note that we have a two decades of experience uh, in Medicaid managed care with state and federal oversight of health plans and the how to do that has evolved. Um, the exchanges, of course, uh, there is some potential, there are some standards in the Affordable Care Act and then there's a lot of potential, even the most ambitious state uh, trying to create a market and get a bunch of plans coming in has been fairly timid about exercising that control. I think um, it is an open question whether or not the quality and cost uh, contracting standards in the exchange will evolve more toward uh, Medicaid, uh, probably not as far as Medicaid has. Um, but it's also, I think, notable that you take a state uh, like Arkansas without that 20-year history, and uh, actually you're not really giving up a lot because you didn't have that 20-year infrastructure, whereas if you take a state uh, like Michigan, where you've been building that over years, uh, that plays out very differently. So just to say that this notion of sort of Medicaid cost control exchange market, th there's a starting point that's about right on average, but actually it very quickly gets a lot more complicated than that. Yes, I'm Tate Hewer with Senator Pryor's office, and I just want to say thank you to Dr. Thompson for the work him and others in state government have done. We're 250,000 people are eligible for the program. We have over 150,000 that have signed up thus far, and it's proven to be wildly popular in the state, despite a lot of restrictions placed on informing people and being able to market the plans. And one question I want to ask is when I first heard about how the private option would work, I was a little bit skeptical because when the Affordable Care Act was being developed in Congress, there was effort to try to minimize churn and have a more uniform marketplace. But the Congressional Budget Office set projected that for 2020, the plans in the marketplace, the QHPs, would be 50% more expensive than what they thought traditional Medicaid plans would cost. And I think one of the things we learned in Arkansas is you get more granular in dealing from one state to another state. There's a lot of difference in what the risk pool is for the Medicaid expansion program, and also with what the costs are for a Medicaid program. And my question is, is states that have not expanded Medicaid at this point, as they evaluate this as an option, what are some of the criteria that would make the third option attractive for a state versus a state that may have challenges trying to make it work? Thank you. You know, I think, you know, you really end up with a conversation about what the state of health care is in your state. And, you know, there is, as I, I think I talked about in my presentation, there are multiple economic aspects to talk about in terms of the impact on the state. You know, how does it affect uncompensated care? How does it affect private insurance premiums and trying to keep that um, under control and, and affordable for employers and for individuals? Um, but also the public health situation, you know, where are you in terms of, you know, obesity rates and diabetes and, and then smoking and a number of these areas that are really important to the health of the state and to the health of individuals. And so I think, you know, just needing to engage in that process in the state and looking at the benefits of coverage. And I think there are benefits of coverage and I think it's a pretty in a lot of ways, a pretty clear-cut case. I mean, it doesn't answer the question of is the federal government going to renege, or you can get in some fairly basic um, issues that need to be worked through. But just, I just want to throw out one example of a comment or a question that we got as we were as we were implementing Healthy Michigan, and an individual wrote in and said, "I've been trying. I have a friend who just signed up for the Healthy Michigan program, and I'm wondering if you cover cataract surgery." And they said, the reason we're a I'm asking is I've been trying to get someone to pay for his cataract surgery, and the optometrist told us that if he would have the surgery, he would have normal vision, and he's lost his job, and he hasn't been able to drive, and this would enable this person to get back and be a 
contributing member of society and, you know, and obviously improve their life. And so I think as you know, as you hear those stories, I mean, there are compelling stories and our governor was really great about getting around the state and hearing some of those stories. And it's not true of the entire population, but I think those stories do illustrate there's a segment of the population that hasn't been getting services, has been reluctant to incur the costs, they haven't found a way to finance this, and their life will improve and they will be able to be more contributing members of society. And that, I think, is part of the argument as well. Yep. I would just add, you know, if you're in a state that has already substantively expanded above 138%, you're going to be bringing it down probably, and this doesn't offer you a new option. If you're in a state that has an effective management function, like Alan alluded to, that your, your Medicaid managed care is working well, then probably that is an expansion strategy that if you can navigate the politics makes more sense. Conversely, if you have a Medicaid managed care system that is not working well, or you, like us, had not invested in a much of a, a managed uh, strategy over the last decades, this is a new and different approach in an individual exchange that depending on how assertive the exchange is managed, offers a real opportunity to leapfrog forward. Uh, I do think operationally it requires your Medicaid director and wherever that authority lives and your insurance commissioner and wherever that authority is to work together in a way that they've never worked together before. Um, Alan? Yes, I, so I started by reminding you all that the vast majority of states that have done the expansion did it uh, just through a state plan amendment. So you have to sort of, you, this conversation only begins in a state where that's not a viable uh, approach uh, for political reasons. Um, in my goings around the country, I would say the defining uh, message that I hear from those who are looking for another way to do this is a sense that uh, Medicaid, uh, and certainly it's part of the broader politics of the Affordable Care Act, that, that Medicaid is a, is a one-size-fits-all program that the federal government, uh, after the court uh, opinion, uh, the federal government was not open to states doing partial expansions. They were not open to limited benefits. And that it's sort of a take it or leave it. And they want to shape this program in a way that fits with their values and with their, uh, the structure of their market and uh, with the resources that they have, acknowledging that uh, they'll pick up a share of the cost in a couple of years. And that a lot of this is just about a sense that uh, the, 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 they, they want to construct something that, that fits um, them, not something that was uh, written and defined in Washington. Now, converting that into a viable uh, waiver proposal that meets the needs uh, and the criteria that I described at the very beginning is quite hard. But uh, fundamentally, I think the conversation begins when a state says they want to do the expansion they don't feel that the Medicaid program as it currently exists is one that they want to expand further, and they're willing to be creative, as these states have been, in trying to figure out uh, a structure that would, be, uh, that would meet the federal government's requirements and, and would enable them uh, to feel good about it if it were uh, ultimately approved. Alan, my only, it may be that you don't want to do the expansion, but you have a problem you must solve. Uh, that would be more our situation. Yes, Jeff. Hi. Jeff Levine, blogger, former CNN medical correspondent. Steve, I wanted to pick up on something you said earlier, that since Healthy Michigan has come into being, there's a greater demand for prescription drugs. So is there out there uh, an unanticipated or unfulfillable demand for service that's going to put additional pressure on your systems individual state systems, 1115, that are a little, little leaner than federal Medicaid? So the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not fully understanding the question. So the concern is about really Much, high demand for prescription yeah. drugs? Well, or anything. In other words, mm -hmm. there's a lot of consumer demand for service that you don't have the surge capacity to fulfill. Well, there was a, there's certainly, the concern in our state was more focused on primary care capacity. And there, were, there was a survey done by an organization, the Center for Health Research and or 
Research and Health Transformation, or Health Research and Transformation, I think I'm screwing up their acronym, any anyway, CHART, we call it, that's affiliated with the University of Michigan. They did a survey of primary care providers and found an overwhelmingly positive response to the ability to take on newly insured patients that would be you know, healthy Michigan patients. And th there also is data that we have that our health plans have in terms of the number of providers that they have paneled. And their ratios are very low in terms of primary care provider to benefit number of beneficiaries, albeit that that's sort of absent the information of how many other insured populations they're taking care of. But all of the data that we saw was very encouraging in terms of the capacity of the system to absorb the population. Now, you know, we're only like five and a half weeks into this or something, but initially, you know, we were paying bills on the, on the second day and individuals were taking their card and they were going to the FQHC because the Primary Care Association was involved in outreach and helping them to, um, you know, enroll in Healthy Michigan and so there were referrals, but people were getting to physicians and to this point, we have not heard of, of, of um, you know, big lines and um, there's a better way to say that, but at any rate, in terms of individuals that are, are having problems with accessing primary care or big, big waiting times, you know, I don't think we have enough information at this point to really know because most of the health plan enrollments won't actually be effective until June 1 for this initial population. And it's certainly a lot of people in a short amount of time in a state like Michigan. You know, we have a population of about 10 million and a Medicaid population of 1.8 something million traditionally. And now we're talking about already having 220,000 individuals and probably gonna hit 300,000 here in the next month or so, we hope, or month and a half. Um, although that's being somewhat optimistic. But in any case, um, that's a lot of people. I don't quite know how it would go, but all the information we've been able to collect and evaluate would suggest that the capacity is there. I think there could be surge issues, but um, in terms of primary care and pharmacy, we, we think we're all right at this point. Joe? If I could, if I could just add, uh, we have similar concerns. Uh, one of the issues around our payment transformation effort is trying to move our, our primary care workforce to really think more about team-based care so that you're scaling the appropriate level of service to the appropriate need, and we think that's a benefit. Uh, anecdotally, again, it's early, but our, our surge happened on the pharmacy side where people had previously seen a provider, had a prescription, but hadn't had a financial mechanism to pay for the prescription, so in January, it was people getting care that they had previously been diagnosed with but were not successfully affecting that care of. Uh, we also potentially have uh, uh, an educational effort for folks who historically had only used the emergency room because they didn't have access to a primary care uh, uh, home. And so, you know, there, there's gonna be some, some migration of folks' usual source of care as they better learn how to utilize the healthcare system. So there's a, just to, um, it's a question on the, on the benefit package um, in, the, in, the, in the, both the Arkansas um, plan and also in Michigan. Um, and in Arkansas, what dental benefits are included in the private option plan? And someone else asked about wraparound benefits. So maybe both of you can explain some of the, the differences in the private option benefit package and, and compared to um, traditional Medicaid. And somebody might explain what a wraparound benefit is. So starting with a definition, which since we don't have Medicaid managed care, I'll probably get wrong, but essentially Medicaid has guaranteed benefits that if a plan doesn't offer, the state is still obligated to provide a access point for. In our private option, those wraparound benefits really include three major areas. Non-emergency transportation, let me back up. So we are buying the essential health benefit on the marketplace, which our state used the um, uh, second largest small group market, which did not include vision or dental as a covered benefit. Uh, the wraparound benefits that we have to make sure people have are non-emergency medical transportation, uh, largely long-term care services, and EPSDT benefits for 19 and 20 year olds. The EPSDT obligation goes up through uh, uh, 20 years of age. So if we have an individual that's likely to need those benefits, we're trying to retain them in the traditional Medicaid program so that we can give them those benefits or to extract them if they do make it into the commercial program when they need those benefits. We're, we're trying to avoid 
as much as we can the coordination of benefits between a commercial plan and a state obligation that wraps around. Now, Sarah asked in one of our transition to market issues, a couple of the plans actually put dental and vision benefits in that SOSIO approved, even though they weren't part of the essential health benefit program, and the state is now paying for it. This actually makes our price point be above what the uh, uh, federal agreement is. Uh, this is one of these marriage issues. We are moving to eliminate those supplemental benefits, if you will, in year two, which will bring the price point back down into alignment. If I were king for a day, I might try to add them to all the benefits, but the rules that we were established with requires us to go with what the state chose as an essential health benefit. I think it's important to remember that the Medicaid enabling legislation was passed in 1965 and it hasn't changed much. And so the list of mandatory versus optional benefits would surprise you, I think. It surprises me when I look at it and I've looked at it for 40 years now. And that's what surprises me is it hasn't changed. So pharmacy is optional even though no state in their right mind would make pharmacy optional and then you have things like non-emergency transportation. But as it relates to the Healthy Michigan program, one, one benefit design change that we made, I think, that might have been as significant as any, is the fact that we included dental in the managed care package previously. And for the traditional program, it's been carved out. And we pay very low fees. And we do have access challenges. And so we've kind of, and we've got a mixed bag. We do a completely different things for kids. And we actually have a very good program for kids in the vast majority of the parts of the state called Healthy Kids Dental, where we partner with Delta Dental. But anyway, by rolling the dental benefit in, we think that you know, we're going to require that there be an you know, adequate network and an organized system of care. And in fact, if you have to do, pay actuarially sound rates, it's a different financing structure as well. So we think that was an important change and a good one. OK. Yes, go right ahead. Hi. I'm Carolyn Kramer. Um, I'm from Consumers Union, and one of the questions that I, that I have is, you mentioned, um, especially Alan, um, that a lot of the questions we have right now about these different approaches to Medicaid, we still don't know the answers. So whether costs will go down, how access and utilization will be affected, um, a lot of those things we just still don't know. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about efforts that are underway to study those things and find out whether they're state government based or whether they're partnerships with universities. I know that um, you know things are sort of have come out and are starting to come out more about, for example, the Oregon Medicaid experiment. Um, so just efforts like that that are underway, what's emerging, what can we kind of expect? Uh. I'm not going to give you a very satisfactory answer. Part of every Section 1115 waiver is an evaluation component. Um, it's hard to summarize because there are dozens and dozens of them, and uh, they cover a lot of different ground. There are people in the audience here who I'm looking at who follow them more closely than I do, and then there are two people here who are living through it, particularly around the questions. Uh, that their, uh, their waivers raise. But there, there is an evaluation component to, to every Section 1115 waiver. Um, and I, I, I believe, um, I can't remember if it was in, in this session or, or just a side conversation before, I mean, I, uh, given the high level of interest in this model, um, there is, I believe, a higher level of interest in the federal government in making sure that those evaluation plans will answer some of these key questions um, because uh, there are others, th the thinking has been that there are other states lining up uh, interested in these approaches, and so we really do need to have the answers. But I, I'm not sure how else to generalize about what the nature of those uh, evaluations uh, is. Just to be explicit, the first amendment to our waiver was our federally approved evaluation plan. An interim report is due at the end of the second year. A final report is due at conclusion of the waiver. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, two or three other evaluations ongoing. Uh, I'm not sure what the timeline on those reports coming out, but there's a fair degree of interest on whether this is successful or not. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and just, um 
Um, just to go on to the uh, next, next question, um, are all of these alternative state Medicaid programs um, appearing to have something in common, which is a move towards managed risk-sharing capitation and away from fee-for-service? Is this critical to the success of the alternative state Medicaid expansion efforts? Well, we think it is. We moved away from fee-for-service in 1997. It gives you a predictable cost, and it also gives you um, some certainty in terms of provider networks and the organization and delivery of services. And where we're looking, and we have a procurement for our managed care program coming up in about a year and a half, and we will be looking to try to affect the business re financing relationships between the plans and the providers to try to move further away from fee-for-service rather than just having them be be a, become a fee-for-service system in their own way, but to try to make sure that we are moving toward value purchasing all the way through our system. So we're, we're there. I would, I would echo prior to the Affordable Care Act, we had started our Arkansas Payment Improvement Initiative, the payment transformation effort that I mentioned to move explicitly away from a fee-for-service reimbursement system, not to a capitated system, but to a value-based outcomes uh, system, uh, maybe on the path to capitation, but we may never get there. The uh, private option actually, it, that was a voluntary effort with our two largest commercial carriers, Medicare, Medicaid, and self-insured companies. The private option legislation requires that all carriers on the exchange now participate in that payment improvement effort uh, as an explicit statement that we don't believe the fee-for-service reimbursement mechanism is the right um, approach to get the value we want out of the system or the outcomes that consumers want from the system. Yeah, the vast majority of, of low-income people without any sort of disability uh, in Medicaid are already in a managed care arrangement. Um, so for most states that would consider this kind of private option, it's not so much a shift from one way of thinking to another as that they've already embraced the model of, of risk sharing and that as they consider an expansion, uh, this is the path uh, they, would, they would naturally take. Uh, let me just say that we are moving into the last few minutes of our session here and I would Deeply appreciate your pulling out the blue valuation forms and starting to fill them out as we go through these last few minutes. Uh, I'm particularly directing that request to uh, those of you on congressional staffs who are here uh, because Senator Rockefeller would say they're not to dismiss anyone else, but that they are uh, our most important target and the most direct policy opinion leaders that we try to reach. So I appreciate it if you would fill that in. Sarah, you've got only about 115 more green cards. So here's, here's another related, somewhat related to the last question, but what is the level of direction and oversight from CMS um, um, with regard to patients, providers, um, and health plans? Um, and I guess I would just um, add, add to this question, um, um, the, uh, some, uh, some approaches have, have healthy behavior incentives. Um, Mich Michigan has a healthy behavior incentive, Iowa does too, and Pennsylvania is also proposing um, a, a set of healthy behavior incentives that are actually tied to having premiums waived in, in subsequent years. Um, and there is, if you read through the waivers, the waiver applications and the approval from, from, from CMS, there is a considerable amount of oversight and attention to, to those incentives and how, and how they'll be evaluated. So I thought maybe that we could discuss that, um, the oversight within the context of those, of those provisions. I, I, our experience has been a fairly uh, intense level of engagement and, and navigation with the CMS officials. I wouldn't say there's that much direction, but they clearly have concrete boundaries that they want to protect in terms of the basic benefit offered through Medicaid, the basic protections afforded to individuals, um, and uh, the, the uh, income gradient that they recognize uh, at lower levels, uh, individuals cannot participate in the same way as someone that has uh, a, a more affluent set of assets. Having said that, I think the bigger issue on many of these new additions are operationally, how are you going to make it work? I mean, that's where the, it's not necessarily oversight or intrusion. 
It's how are you going to make that healthy behavior assessment actually have meaning and how are you going to reach the individuals? I mean, we're having a hard time with some of our individuals finding them to give them their insurance card. Uh, I mean, we have hundreds that are homeless. Uh, the, the, these are not small operational issues. So building the bells and whistles, at least in the early years, uh, we can have a dialogue and a discussion about the goals and objectives of the, pro of the program. But I think uh, uh, many of our issues are let's make sure we can operationally back to Steve's early, earliest thing. We have to be successful on implementation or else this is really an at-risk program and the more challenges you lay on top of in early years, uh, the more likelihood you're uh, going to have an implementation failure. It's always good to follow Joe because then I can sort of piggyback on the comments. You know, I think it's fair to say that states almost always would like more freedom than what the federal government will afford us. And it's, and it's also true that the health plans that we oversee want more freedom than we give them. I mean, it's sort of a natural law of some kind. Um, but I think, and, and I think it's fair to say that our experience is that we have a very ambitious agenda in terms of the legislation. And it's about, you know, financial contributions and having skin in the game. It's about healthy behaviors. It's about accountability. It's about alignment of incentives. It's about a whole bunch of things trying to affect the public health that really move the Medicaid program to the next level. And I think, you know, there are, there are certain places where the federal government does have, you know, they, they have values that they are concerned about in terms of protections and so forth. And so there's sometimes discussion on those, but I think they have been quite flexible and open, frankly, in terms of the program that we have and the legislation that we have in terms of getting from here to there on the implementation. Um, I would just state uh, what is m maybe obvious, but is I think often not re uh, referred to in a conversation like this. Uh, the private option is a Medicaid expansion. It's not a different program. And that means that people who enroll in a plan through a private option are Medicaid enrollees. And that means that all of the constraints and conditions that the state or the federal government would put uh, around the terms of that uh, are present um, unless they're uh, relieved uh, due to a waiver. So contracting with plans through an exchange is not qualitatively different than contracting with plans directly, which is what state Medicaid agencies do all the time. The issue is that the exchange plan relationship is still, it's brand new. And so we don't know much about it. We don't know where it's going to settle out. Um, so I do think that, um, it, we do, uh, one of the earlier questions was sort of I talked about one kind of thing and the others were all operational. I do think much of this is operational. The boundaries are fairly clear. The question is operationally, can you make it work? And if you do make it work, do you get the benefits that you thought you were going to get? Uh, but in terms of what the flexibility is for the state, it's not really that different from any other Section 1115 waiver. Uh, and the, uh, the legal entitlement to the enrollee is no different from the legal entitlement to anyone else on Medicaid. Sherry, you've got one last question for one, us? One final question. Um, just looking forward to um, states moving forward on their exchanges or their marketplaces. Do you, do the, do you see, do you think the inter interstate exchange markets, so states, states partnering with other states to create broader um, insurance markets is an, is an option for, for states in terms of lowering costs and moving forward. Any appetite for that in Arkansas uh, or uh, anywhere uh, else? At, at some level, I think an interstate exchange is an opportunity for reducing administrative costs. We've obviously seen the administrative costs associated to bringing up all of these different exchanges. The barriers to doing so, and my organization's put together a paper on this because one state requested an analysis of doing a multi-state exchange, uh, are well known to those who work in this field. Um, and they have a lot to do with the fact that, uh, that insurance is regulated at the state level. And there's a, a, a relationship there that would have to be uh, unraveled and redesigned if you uh, worked across state lines in that area. Um, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that the plan issues uh, uh, that, uh, change if you have an interstate exchange. I think it's primarily about administrative infrastructure. You know, the, the one thing that is present are the multi-state plans, which is not quite an interstate exchange, but it, it is 
the potential to increase some competition across plans. Uh, I cannot imagine an interstate exchange, sorry, it's difficult, difficult for me to imagine in, an interstate exchange either helping facilitate or not being a real challenge to a state that's doing the third way expansion. I, I, I don't want the 36 counties of Mississippi. Uh, I want to keep my 75 and try to get them as covered as possible because that's within the degrees of political, operational, and policy uh, flexibility that I have. Okay. Well, this has been, at least for me, an enlightening conversation. And uh, keep in mind the title of Alan's presentation, What Does It Take to Get to Yes? We're going to be watching this as it develops over the, not just the next weeks, but the next couple of years. And uh, we'll see if people are moving to yes and what the barriers are to trying to get them there. We are going to continue this conversation on Friday in a slightly different way with our colleagues at the Commonwealth Fund by looking at, and there were some references to them today, the federally qualified health centers, the FQHCs. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to take a look at how well prepared they are for new enrollment, new rules, new opportunities, and we'll see uh, uh, if we can't try to find another way around toward helping uh, states get closer to yes, uh, at least in the capacity part. I want to thank our, our friends and colleagues, Sarah Collins and her colleagues at the Commonwealth Fund for their uh, work on this, on this topic and in this briefing. Uh, thank you for both uh, sitting through a pretty dense and, and uh, uh, fact-rich Present set of presentations and discussion, uh, and ask you to thank, help me thank the panel for explaining most of those difficult situations in a very erudite and understandable way. <laughs>